בשם השם נעשה ונצליח, שיעור תורה. ברוכים הבאים, all the online fans. We uh, have our uh, unusual setup for our uh, shiur. Try to make whatever we can out of the blessing that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave us, Baruch Hashem. So uh, we have our Emunah Bitachon uh, book, which is uh, how we're starting our uh, Jewish Ashkafa series, based on Chazonish. And uh, over the last few weeks, Baruch Hashem, I think we've gotten woken up quite a few times by the Chazonish, and the Zod Hashem today will continue. Uh, tonight's shiur will be uh, for Refua Shlema for Rabbanit Levana Bat Sara, uh, Sara Bat Levana, uh, Rabbi Ephraim Ben Shulamit, Rabbanit Sara Bat Anat, uh, Doris Bat Jora, David Ben Nesriya, אורית בת אילנה, יתרו בן אברהם, טליה בת שרה, מיכל בת יעל, סרח בת בתיה, בתיה בת שרה, סטפן בן קטרינה, ג'ונס בן שרי היילי, ואוסו פה הצלחה רבה פור שאול בן פרזנה, אושרי בן דוריס, גבי בן דוריס, אלעד בן דוריס, דוד בן נסריה, יתרו בן אברהם, And all of Am Yisrael, Lord Hashem, and also in um, uh, Marsha Bat Juli, and her daughter Ayla Bat Marsha. Kedosh Baruch Hu Yivarech Otam, Bekol Mikol Kol, Chayim Arukim, Shlemim, Eleim Torah, Mitzvot, Kedil Chasadim, Nachat, and Atzlacha Raba to all of the uh, donors, supporters, all of the wonderful people that uh, Baruch Hashem are helping us now and uh, over the last few years. So, uh, A little bit of a uh, update for anyone uh, that's uh, not aware, because a lot of people keep asking, where's the shiur, where's the shiur? So about two weeks ago, uh, our arrangement with the shul that we had uh, came to an end. And uh, so for already for a couple of months, we've been looking for a uh, new place to have our live shiur with the, uh, with the audience. But, uh, you know, it seems like uh, it's a little bit more difficult to find. The Kadosh Baruch Hu wants to send us a little bit of a bigger goose chase than we thought. So, Baruch Hashem, a, uh, because of the two things happen at the same time, we uh, simply uh, did not have a place to give the shiur in with a live audience. We figured not to have a shiur for uh, an unknown amount of time doesn't really make much sense. So, we're going to make do what we can. Uh, the uh, place, uh, you know, we're looking for, we're looking for a big place, but it seems like uh, for us to get what we want, we're going to have to build it. So it's both a combination of uh, money and regulations and so on that led us to that conclusion. Initially, we thought that maybe we could just move into a place, uh, just rent out a very big space, but uh, that's not possible. Uh, the um, arrangements that uh, they have for religious organizations are very different than, let's say, just a regular retail store. So in so many words, that's not possible. What we need to do is uh, we need to get some type of space for now for, for the lectures and then as other Shem start working on a, uh, a bigger uh, uh, place uh, and to build a bigger place as other Shem. For that, of course, we're going to need a lot of your help. Uh, on the good side, uh, we have a uh, uh, great news from Eretz Yisrael. The uh, seminar for girls had their first meeting with all of the uh, teachers and volunteers Just a few days ago, they just sent me the video. Uh, they had a guest lecturer come to give everybody chizuk. Uh, and Baruch uh, Hashem, it looks, it looks very promising. They're uh, anticipating this about somewhere like uh, 40 or so people, teachers and volunteers that are going to be teaching the girls. And we're expecting somewhere in the neighborhood of 400 girls. So uh, just to uh, give people an understanding of what we're looking at. And the, uh, the guest rabbi that came uh, to, to give people chizuk, he said uh, he liked the idea so much that he going to start you know, recommending it to all other organizations because what's happening right now in the, uh, in the Jewish world is uh, really a big tragedy um, simply because you, know, you work so hard to get people to become religious, you work so hard to get people to uh, start keeping Shabbat and so on. Uh, You know, while at the same time, you're finding out that the religious community, since they haven't had the same 
environment that they're used to. They haven't had the same yeshiva, they haven't had the same seminar for the girls. For already an extended period of time, you're starting to see many of them fall off the derech. Uh, many of them start become weaker. Many of them start dating before they're allowed to or supposed to. Uh, and it's like a, uh, you're, you're filling up the, uh, the bucket with water, but there's holes in the bottom. Uh, and it really, that's really what's happening right now in the religious world, where yes, we're making Baruch Hashem a lot of Baalei Tshuva, but these Baalei Tshuva are starting to walk into communities, and they're seeing more problems in the Frum communities than sometimes they saw in the secular communities or not-so-religious communities. So something obviously has to be done. You can't just, uh, you know, let it be. And, uh, you know, the whole concept of Bitachon is really one of the main principles that a person needs to have, as uh, Rav Alimi, the, the leader of this particular project for us, uh, said in the lecture, he said that the, uh, he once uh, saw a story, uh, or heard a story firsthand actually, from uh, the son of the founder of Arachim. Arachim, for anyone who doesn't know, is perhaps, uh, if not the biggest, but one of the biggest Kiruv organizations in the world. It's uh, for sure the oldest. Uh, Q of organizations in the world. Uh, they do uh, over 200 seminars a, a year, uh, specifically focusing, uh, you know, on the Israeli crowd for many years. But I think recently they started dealing with uh, English speakers. Anyway, the uh, the founder of Achim, uh, his son, uh, his son says, uh, his son Avishai, Rabbi Avishai, says uh, that uh, Rabbi Weiss is a uh, fond of birds likes birds. So uh, he had this uh, tuki, this parrot. And uh, one day this parrot flew away. So at one of the seminars they, uh, that the Arachim had, uh, they started talking about different mitzvot and they started talking about the mitzvah of Ashavat Aveda. It's a uh, mitzvah of returning something that you found that somebody perhaps lost. And it says, you know, the whole issue of when do you return it, when do you not return it, and the key is if it has signs. And they started talking about if it has signs, then obviously you, and you can identify the owner by that, then you have to return it if it's to a uh, Jewish person, and you should return it if it's to a non-Jewish person, just not obligated in the same way. But it would, you know, uh, fulfill me to have Kiddush Hashem. Point being is that one of the people in the crowd uh, says to the rabbi, Rabbi, listen, uh, based on what you're saying about returning what was lost, I don't know, I have this, uh, this bird. He goes, what bird do you have? He goes, oh, I found this parrot, and uh, it has signs. Do I need to return it? He's like, yeah, you have to return it. And just, uh, it's, you know, what kind of sign? Did it have this sign? Said, yeah. What sign? This sign? Yeah. This sign? Yeah. 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 That's the bird. That's the bird we were looking for. And he's like, uh, what brought you here? What brought you to this seminar? It's yet the Shmaya you're here, but still, what brought you here? He said, the bird. The bird is the one that brought me here. He goes, I don't keep nothing, but uh, since ever since I found this bird, every few minutes it says, Shakon Yemidvo, Shakon Yemidvo, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Hashem. I keep repeating the same, the same blessings that I heard in the house of the rabbi. So, anyway, shortly later, the bird flew away again. The bird flew away again. They went looking for it, and they said, you know what, this time, let's go try in a pet store. They went to a pet store, and one of the people said, yeah, I think that's the bird. And they uh, told the uh, owner, listen, there's signs on this bird, it's this, it's that, it's this. He said, yeah, yeah, that's the bird, I found it. He shows him the bird, ah, that's the bird. He said, listen, this bird is amazing. He always says, Shakon all types of blessings. And the guy tells him, the rabbi tells him, no, you don't understand, this bird already got one person to do tshuva. He goes, from what? From all the blessings, remind him about the blessings. He goes, you know what? If this bird could get people to seminars, I'm going to a seminar also. And that guy did tshuva also. So Rabbi Vishai came to his Abba, came to his, uh, the head of the Arachim, and he says, Abba, look, look how holy you are. You're so holy, you're making so many people by let you up, that even your bird is doing Kiruv. The head of the Arachim did not get confused for a second. And he says to him, no, no, my son, you misunderstood the message. You misunderstood the message. What Hashem is trying to tell us here is that when he wants, even a tuki, even a bird can get somebody to do tshuva. It's not us. It's all Hashem. It's all Hashem. And sometimes we get confused. Sometimes we think that we're doing a lot more than what we are. So the key is that, you know, what you can do is you can try. That's all you can do. That's your responsibility in the world. That's your effort. If there's no 
leader there, you be the leader. That's in anything in your life. You're never doing anything other than effort because success is in the hands of Hashem. And that's in essence what we're trying to do in Alex Yisrael, what we're trying to do in America, all over the world. We're trying to put our efforts there to at the very least, maybe a Kadosh Baruch Hu will decide to use us as a vessel to get people to come back to him. And Baruch Hashem, so far so good. So in Eretz Yisrael, we have the seminar going. It's a, uh, Baruch Hashem, uh, we're expecting the first meeting to happen uh, in the next, uh, I think, next week. And uh, Bezot Hashem, we're also going to be recording all of these uh, lectures. They're all going to be in Hebrew, but we're going to record them and put them on one of our channels. So uh, people are going to be able to see some of the stuff. And uh, like I said, the, uh, uh, anyone that wants to be a partner in this particular project is more than welcome to. Uh, we're expecting a run rate of around $20,000 a month. A uh, quarter million dollars a year, approximately, give or take. Anyone that wants to be a part of it, please, uh, you know, send the donations through the website. Regular donation, you could just make a comment on the bottom, say that that's what you want to do. Uh, it just takes too much time for me to make a campaign for every little project that we have because we literally have just way too many projects. Uh, but Bo Hashem, it's that's a good thing too. There's need out there, and we're going to try to do it. Uh, already a couple of people volunteered to uh, to help, but Bo Hashem, there's more needed. On a side note, again, it's a, uh, these are all things that people always ask me about, and that's why I mention them. Uh, the, uh, the campaign for the coronavirus uh, issues where people are uh, struggling continues. People ask me what's going on with it, and I keep telling people to keep donating as much as possible. Just before Shabbat, on, um, on Thursday night, I got a uh, crying message at somewhere around 3 o'clock in the morning. Uh, you know, from a person that we usually deal with, but was sent to somebody else that maybe they could talk to me. Why are they crying? Winter is coming, and in some places already here, and people don't have winter clothes. Why? The kids grew up, and uh, the, clo the clothes don't grow with them. So, Shemi Shmovi Yatsil, you have many kids now at a point where not only they're struggling financially, they don't have food, but uh, a lot of kids are, uh, you know, unfortunately don't have clothes. So, Bo Hashem. Uh, it was uh, early enough that we were still awake right away. I made the uh, arrangements. We sent already $5,000 just to get something going for Shabbat, to get some people whatever they needed to eat and things like that. But the point being is that that campaign continues. There's a lot of need. Don't ask me if you can send clothes. Don't send clothes. There's not, no clothes to send. We just need to send money. Why? Because to send the clothes costs more than the clothes. Doesn't make any sense. They have clothes over there. They have clothing stores over there. One person that tried sending clothes from Israel over there arrived and was rejected. Why? The clothes weren't modest. These people are not chilonim. They're not uh, secular people. So they can't just wear anything you send them. Uh, and again, they need to be modest. So I, uh, I tell people, they want to help, they can send money. They don't want to help, no big deal. Either way, do something else with your money. But the key is that there's a lot of need out there for good things. And each person has to uh, determine what, where they want their money to be invested because at least a few times a week people ask me, should I invest in some, should I invest in real estate, should I buy a second house in Florida, should I invest in gold, should I buy some more stocks, what do you think about Bitcoin, what do you think about all these things, and I keep telling people, I don't talk about investments, you want to talk about real investments, the ones that last forever, yeah, we have many good projects to help people that, while they're alive, but you want to go buy gold, copper, all these different things, that you have to go to my previous Gilgul. If you can go back in time, go back to my previous Gilgul, I'll probably give you good advice, but it'll be expensive, though, won't be free. Anyway, it's uh, important for people to know that all the money that you're investing in all of these wonderful things, there's Bitcoins and the gold and the copper and all that other stuff, none of it is going to help you in actual life. None of it. And the reason why people do it so much, they're so focused on building a retirement plan, they're so focused on building a so-called nest egg, uh, they're so focused on, you know, uh, competing with the Joneses, actually has very much to do with this entire series and this particular lecture uh, at hand because it has to do with bitachon. It has to do with confidence in Hashem. Because what the Chazonish has told us already over these last uh, few months is that we don't even know what bitachon is. Needless to say, habit in many cases, because until recently, many people tell me that until a couple of weeks ago when we discussed the Chazonish in a lecture, most people thought that Bitachon is like the green thing. Bitachon is like the, uh, the parrots thing. What, what is Bitachon? Bitachon is 
Just have confidence in Hashem and everything good's going to happen. That's what they thought Bitachon is. They figured that if they have a positive, you know, a, uh, uh, a positive uh, uh, attitude, good things will happen. That's what they thought. And Chazonish has taught us, if anything, that there's nothing further from the truth. There's nothing further from the truth. It's Bitachon. It's not that. It simply isn't. First and foremost, we have to understand Bitachon and Emuna are two different things, but nonetheless, but needless to say, they're very, very closely connected where they can easily be confused. Now, the Ramban, Nachmanides, has a sefer about Bitachon. I don't know if he has it in English, but he has a sefer about Bitachon. He wrote about Bitachon. Ramban, uh, almost uh, 850 years ago or so, I don't think that there is anything he didn't write about. It's, it's just so amazing how much he was able to write in a single lifetime without the help of computers, without the help of Wikipedia, without the help of, of, of having everything in a, uh, you know, a click away. Like the entire Torah is just sitting in his tongue and will ease. Same thing with all of our Chachamim. People simply don't understand how many Chachamim, how many amazing Chachamim we, we have that uh, it's sad that people don't value what they really, uh, what we are connected to, Baruch Hashem. Anyway, the Ramban, Ramban says something very interesting in his uh, Sefer, about Bitachon. He says, Ki Bitachon u lemala ma'emuna, ki bechlal Bitachon u emuna. That Bitachon is more significant, is higher than emuna. Because within the bitachon is emuna, meaning someone can have bitachon. Bitachon meaning confidence in Hashem. Emuna meaning faith in Hashem. Someone can have emuna, but not necessarily bitachon. But whoever has bitachon definitely has emuna. Why? Because within the bitachon, within the confidence of Hashem, is the emuna itself. But if you just have emuna, it doesn't mean that you automatically have bitachon. Because many people have emuna, but not necessarily bitachon. So how, how do we how do we uh, get to this? This is where the Chazonish comes in. We now begin second chapter, part two. We're in the second chapter of the bitachon of a uh, Bashem by the Chazonish. We were just completed last week the first section of chapter two. Now we're beginning the second section of chapter two. And this is what the Chazuni says. There's other shit. Velamu, I am unaba bitachon achati. Rak I am una i am a bat a clearly shela bealea. Ve bitachon am a bat shela maamin alatsmo. I am una bepchinat alacha. Ve bitachon bepchinat maase. Translation According to this, Everything that we've learned, which we'll elaborate in a moment. Emuna and Bitachon and Hashem are one and the same, meaning they're inter interly connected. Just that Emuna, faith, is the general approach of, of a believing person. And Bitachon, the trust in Hashem, is the person's approach to himself with faith being the Alakha meaning the theory, and bitachon, trust, being the practice. So now, he says, according to this, let's first, whoever has not listened to the last 20 or so lectures, may not even know what we're talking about. Now, I highly recommend you go all the way to the beginning of the series, and even subscribe to the channels, and do all the things that you need to do to make sure you keep getting the updates, whether it's the WhatsApp groups and everything else, but not everybody's going to listen to me. So with that being said, we have to give a little bit of a rundown and also a refresher for a reminder for the rest of us of what does he mean according to this? According to what? Especially the last two lectures. Last two or three lectures, he went really into the depth of what Emunah and Bitachon are. So let's, let's get a refresher. First and foremost, Emunah. Emunah doesn't just simply mean have faith in Hashem and everything okay is going to happen. doesn't mean that. And when I have understanding that a Kadosh Baruch Hu is the one that runs the world, he is the one that is in control of anything. No one can hurt you or help you without Hashem signing off on it. 
There is no such thing as Hitler killed six million people. It's that Hashem used Hitler to kill six million people. There is no such thing as this guy won the lotto and this guy invented the new, uh, new, uh, newest gadget that's going to save uh, some, uh, some people in the world, some uh, cure for a disease. No, Hashem used all of these different people to do His will. There is nothing separate from Hashem, including the Satan. The Satan is simply a servant of Hashem. That's all he is. The belief that the Satan is going against Hashem is a Christian belief. It's a heretical belief. There is no such thing. There's also a, uh, people that don't know this, people that believe that the Satan is in essence against Hashem, where he simply does whatever he wants, are only a small rock throw away from becoming Satanists, because that's what the Satanists believe. Satanists believe that the Satan was insulted by Hashem, and therefore he decided to go against them, and in reality for them, the Satan is the good guy, and Chaz Shalom Hashem is the bad guy. So it's very important to know Satan, Yetzara, Malach Hamavit, all being the same, the Gemara and Bachot, and several other places say, he is a servant of Hashem. He utilizes different tools in the world that Hashem allows him to use. All of these people, all of these people that people are, you know, scared of, whether it's uh, you know the the, the politicians or it's a uh, different types of other bad people, nothing to be scared of. Why? Hashem is the one that's using them. Hashem is the one that's pulling the strings on everything. You don't need to be so fanatic about watching the news every three seconds just to make sure you're up to date on bad guys. You're up to date on what the bad guys are doing. Like people are so fanatic about this whole election and who won and who lost and there's cheating and there's lying. Who cares? Hashem is the one that's allowing it to happen. A person that has real bitachon will not waste a single minute, a single minute being worried about that or anything else. Now, getting bitachon takes a little bit of effort, but you should know if you're worried, there's a lacking in your bitachon, you should stay connected to these shulim and continue listening with us. Why? Because when you understand what bitachon is, you'll understand that there's nothing to worry about other than HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The only thing you should worry about is HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's it. Am I doing His will or am I not doing His will? Is He is he useful for Him to have me in the world? Is it not useful for Him to have me in the world? Simple. Because Abuteach Ba'ashem Chesed Yisobibenu. Someone that has confidence in Hashem, only kindness will surround him. But what does it really mean to have uh, confidence in Hashem? What does it mean to have confidence in Hashem? First, we have to know what it is. First, we have to know what it is, confidence. So first off, before we get to Pitachon, we have to know what Emunah is. Emunah is understanding that Hashem he is the controller of everything. There is no separate power from him. Not Bibi Netanyahu, not a, uh, Donald Trump, not the other guy that's there, the senile guy that's uh, supposed to be the next president. None of these things have any control. Not coronavirus and not the next one. Nothing in the world is separate from Hashem. Hashem simply is the one pulling all the tricks. This is not such a hard belief. This is not such a hard thing to attain because any any person that's you know slightly above uh, into the IQ of a monkey can understand that this world is too perfect to be managed on auto, to be managed independent of any anybody driving the wheel. It's too perfect. People always tell me, "Oh, can you give me a proof that there's a God? Best proof in the world." You, you idiot. You. You, 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 you idiot. You that's asking the question, give me a proof that's God. You are, you are the proof. Why? Look, at, don't you, don't you ever wonder how come you don't have an eyebrow but on your back? Or how come your nose didn't just decide to go next to your ear? Or how come you have the same amount of teeth like other people? And how come they're white? And how come there's flesh, a piece of meat that grew something hard? Did you ever see something else do that? Did you ever, did you ever actually look at the makeup of your body and realize that your heart beats over 100,000 times every minute? To create a machine to do that is almost impossible. A machine. And guess what? That machine needs some power to, 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 to allow it to do it. What power is connected to your heart? What's making your heart beat? What? You're going to tell me molecules, you're going to tell me uh, uh, atoms, you're going to tell me electrons, you're going to tell me hormones, you're going to tell me all these different things that you saw in some discovery channel. Okay, exactly. So the point is, is that the power that's in you, the perfection that's in you as a human being is the best proof in the world that there's a God that's running the world. 
but some people are not satisfied with such an answer so Baruch Hashem we have many shurim in regards to Torah and science uh, we have a whole movie series of it Baruch Hashem we have actually one that's in the making as we speak with a uh, work that we did uh, with uh, my dear friend Rabbi Sebag who's also a uh, genius scientist literally a rocket scientist uh, and uh, Baruch Hashem the video is being made but uh, the point being is that there is an enormous amount of proofs that are literally right in front of any seeing person's face that will show you that God runs the world. That's in essence emuna. Bitachon is something different. Now, before we get to Bitachon, the Chazomish says, well, how do you get this emuna though? If I see enough science Torah movies, will that give me emuna? Chazomish says, no. Well, why? He says, because to acquire emuna, you have to perfect your character traits in accordance to what HaKadosh Baruch Hu said. You'll see the Creator, not just through His creation, because you could see His creation and deny it, like many of these scientists do, and many of these supposable mini-scientists that are sitting at home watching YouTube, uh, you know, uh, deny the creation. So how come some people see God in the creation and some people don't? It's all based on character traits, the Chazuni says. If you perfect your character traits, you lower your anger because God said so, you lower your stinginess because God said so, you perfect yourself, you become a better quality human being in accordance to God's instructions, you will acquire by default, you acquire emuna because you'll become a better, cleaner vessel to receive the divine presence, you, to receive divine providence. You'll actually be able to feel Hashem as you perfect your character traits, hence the reason why the Gaumi Vilna says that the whole purpose of a person in this world is to perfect their character traits. The mitzvot that we have are things that we're supposed to utilize to perfect our character traits. Not we're supposed to perfect our character traits and then do mitzvot. It's rather the mitzvot are tools to help us perfect our character traits. So now to perfect our character traits, we acquire emunah. Now, he says, what is bitachon? Bitachon is not just believing that Hashem runs the world, but rather Hashem is running your personal world, however small or big you think it is. There is no big or small to Hashem. Everything is the same. Past, present, future, big person, small person, male, female, baby, animal, plant, rock. Everything is the same to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. It's all His creation. And you have to know that no matter how big or small your life is in your own mind, Hashem is monitoring every single second or fraction of a second of your life and knows exactly what's in your thoughts. As it says in several places where HaKadosh Baruch Hu tells us literally that He knows our thoughts. This is in uh, Book of Kings chapter 8 verse 39. HaKadosh Baruch Hu is simply telling the, telling the Prophet, for you alone, for you alone knew the hearts of all the people. You knew exactly what's in the heart. You knew exactly what the, she was feeling when she put the Kisu Rosh on the first time. She knew exactly what, you knew exactly what she was feeling after the first date with that Shiduch. You knew exactly what he was feeling when he told her, no, no, I am, I'm not really sure I'm ready to get married. You know exactly what everybody was feeling when he said, no, no, we got a good deal. I'm, I'm being honest with you. You know exactly what they were feeling when they were really cheating, but said I was being honest and so on and so forth. Kadosh Baruch Hu knows everything. He knows everything. So a person needs to understand that Kadosh Baruch Hu knows your struggle. Wherever you may be in the world, he knows how difficult you have it. And guess what? He's the one that gave it to you. Why? Because he also knows you can do it. You can overcome the struggle. It's not, it's not a, uh, a mistake, Chaz Shalom. There is no mistakes. HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows the difficulty that you're dealing with, not having a house right now, not having a car right now, not having a job right now, being a little sick, being really sick, being alone, being addicted, being this, being that. HaKadosh Baruch Hu knows everything. And guess what? He's the one that's with you when you don't even want to be with Him. He's still with you. Because He knows that you could overcome it. But he's not going to do it for you. You have to do it for yourself. That's your job in the world. So Bitachon is believing that HaKadosh Baruch Hu is specifically monitoring our lives, but even more so, even more so, that everything 
that's going to happen. All of the outcomes are from him, thereby they're good. Meaning, there is no such thing as believing that if I think good, good things will always happen. They sometimes will, they sometimes won't. Bitachon is believing that whatever happens is the will of Hashem, as we know from Emunah, because that's, he's the one that's running the world. But Bitachon is having the confidence that whatever it is that happened is the best possible thing that could happen out of all the choices that are available to us. So with that being said, Chazuni says that according to what we've just learned, again, this is six, seven, nine hours or whatever, whatever been the last few shulim, it is in a matter of 10 minutes. So you want more details, you have to listen to the other shulim. So now according to this, according to what we just covered briefly, Emunah and Bitachon are very closely connected. Just as Emunah is the general approach of, of a believing person, Bitachon is the person's approach to himself. So now what's in essence the main difference here as far as the practicality of things? He says Emunah is based on Alacha. Not Alacha as far as the law, but that's actually an interesting chidush we'll go over in a second. But he says Alacha meaning in theory. Emunah is simply the thought process, the theoretical process of how Hashem is running the world and how you're connected to how you are understanding that HaKadosh Baruch is running the world. Whereas the Bitachon is the actual practice. How are you applying that in your actual real life? Also, as a side note, slight chidush, it's interesting that the Chazuni says that Bitachon is in regards to Allah and, and, and the, uh, I'm sorry, that uh, Imunah is in regards to Allah and Bitachon is in regards to Maaseh, in regards to action, because really that's also, that's also true. Meaning, Imunah, you have to have Imunah to follow the Torah. You have to have some level of emunah, emunah in the Chachamin, emunah in the Kadosh Baruch Hu, emunah twice from, you know, we got it at Mount Sinai, a Kadosh Baruch Hu gave it to millions of Jews at the same time, and it's not some fairy tale like the other religions make up, that just some one guy was wandering in the middle of the zoo or, or the desert and he got something, none of that garbage. You have to have emunah that the story from the Torah precisely is the only way we received Torah from a Kadosh Baruch Hu, there is nothing else. Even you, even though you don't remember it, even if you don't have any friends or family that perhaps could tell you stories that they were there, you have to have emuna, and you have to have emuna in the chachamim that instilled the laws that are both biblical and rabbinical into the world by explaining to us how to apply the biblical laws from three thousand years ago into today's world, and also added some rabbinical laws in order to put a fence around the fence in order to protect us from ourselves. You have to have this emunah in the halacha. You have to have the emunah in the halacha. And bitachon, what does bitachon have to do with maaseh? If you have bitachon in the kadosh baruch Hu, you have bitachon in the Torah, you have bitachon in the chachamim, the messengers of the kadosh baruch Hu, you'll take all of that halacha and you'll apply it in your day-to-day -day life. You'll apply it in your day-to-day -day life. Why? Because what happens is a lot of people, they learn Torah. They have some halachot, they have some mitzvot, they have some different things. And uh, unfortunately, uh, they're fakers. Simple. How? Look, many times we talked about the cash advance business. Cash advance business being a rotten business, destroying people. Just today we saw a video that there's an entire building, an entire building in New York that is being evicted. A bunch of Jewish people live in there. Everybody's being evicted. Why? Because the landlord, the owner of the building, Borrowed some money from some uh, some uh, some company, some that charged him apparently too much interest for him to pay. In so many words, he lost. He uh, he wasn't able to make uh, ends meet. He wasn't able to pay the, uh, the the payments on time. From what it looks like, defaulted on a loan. They took over the entire building, and they're not normal people that say, "Listen, we took over the entire building. Let's keep the tenants and let's uh, at least let people live." No, what do they do? They forced all tenants, ninety uh, families. To leave the building. So the, the news, uh, the news uh, article said that there's uh, something like 80 or 90 little kids in the building. Everybody's evicted in the middle of winter, in the beginning of winter. It's a rotten business, but unfortunately, this lending business, why Kadosh Baruch Hu already cursed this business, and uh, Kadosh Baruch Hu hates this business. And Shlomo Melech did a uh, made a takana that you're not even allowed to lend goyim money with high interest. You could charge small interest that's normal, but not high interest. But even in the days of Shlomo Melech, he didn't want anyway to charge any interest. And any, any, on and on and on and on. The point being is, 
that this rotten business unfortunately also happens to be a business you'll find many religious Jews and unfortunately many Erev rabbis that are saying oh no no it's a mitzvah you should do it lend money with interest that you make a living and they'll come out and distort all types of verses from the Torah to permit the pig over time even if you put lipstick on it it's still a pig it's still a pig and the lending business is a pig so how come you're going to see religious people in it for the same reason that you see a lot of other things in the world alma de shika is a world of lies sometimes you'll see somebody it's so-called a religious person even a rabbi literally violate the law of the land and the law of the torah worse than some secular person would i just got a story just in the last few days somebody tells me listen there's this business where we're uh, actually marketing the business but we're telling we're calling all types of uh, all types of uh, potential customers and uh, we're telling them hey listen we're calling from uh you're the company that you're using are you using a company yeah we're calling from that company they're not calling from that company they're calling from b company completely different company no we're calling from the company that you're using you're you're, you're using them yeah we're calling from there but listen we have something new we have something new that we want to renew your stuff so do you mind if one of our salesmen calls you and then uh, just uh, redoes the contract sends you some new equipment customer says yeah of course well who does want something new from the same company i'm already trusting sure why not salesman comes in says ah okay so we have a new system we're going to send it to you and uh you got it. just going to say a different name on the invoice from now on it's not going to say a uh, abc it's going to say uh xyz what does the customer care oh sure because he trusts the company guess what abc and xyz have nothing to do with each other they're competitors competitors they're lying it's a million and a half different sins it's lying which first of all you're not allowed to lie you're supposed to stay away from lies it's also gnevadat gnevadat is stealing somebody's uh knowledge and, and thoughts it's a million differences especially that has money to do with it but guess what why is the kid confused why is the guy that's calling me confused about this the owner of the company is a speaker on the internet oh no the company is a speaker on the internet you guys probably see him online don't worry we'll expose his name soon the speaker on the internet you see him on uh, any of these different uh, websites him and his brother the speakers on the internet what do they tell you oh, nah. believe in Hashem Hashem loves you <laughs> what happened to Emunah Bitachon why why don't where's your Emunah Bitachon you're cheating all these people why don't you have enough Emunah that if, even if you told the truth that you're a nobody you're trying to build your company it's they'll still do business with you that's the reality so what we see here is that sometimes Emuna, you can have the emunah where you have the halakha, the guy could be a rabbi, he could be someone with a hat up to the sky, you can have a beard that could sweep the floor, all the stuff, all the goods, appearance. Bitachondo, you can't fake. You can't fake in over the long period of time. Why? There's a moment of truth that comes. You could fake it to tell people that you have bitachon, 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 but when push comes to shove, you see other person act. Ah, the masse. So then the chazunish continues. Chazunish continues and he says the following it's easy to have bitachon at times when the need to have bitachon does not play an important one in one's life meaning it's easy to have bitachon just you woke up in the day you woke up in the morning oh yeah I love Hashem bitachon Hashem oh it's get to work on time I have a job you have some money in the bank you're married, you got kids, Baruch Hashem, everything is okay, it's easy to have bitachon. Somebody tells you, listen, I'm struggling with my life. Nah, listen, man, have bitachon. You need to tell somebody else to have bitachon. No, you should just have a munah. Don't worry, you're going to get a job. It's easy to give people advice. Easy to give shulim about bitachon. It's easy to read the books about bitachon. Easy, what? Because when he says, it's easy to have this bitachon when it doesn't actually play an important part in the person's life at that moment. It's much more difficult to have bitachon at times when it's indeed called for be'emet. When the moment of truth, when the moment of emet, rega shel emet, shows up, then it's hard to have bitachon. Then it's really hard. What is this like? Rabbi Ephraim, God bless him, gave a fantastic example. He says this. Yitzhara is a genius. Genius. What does he do? He makes you think you have bitachon. How does he do it? Now, if you are at war, you're at war, 
Now, you can't just be at war like you do when you play little games with your own little soldiers and everybody just smashes into each other because that's not exactly a good way to go to war. What do you do in real war? What do you do? You have to be smart. You have to plan. I'm going to go from here, and he's going to think I'm going to come from here and here, and you have to plan. But of course, with all the satellites and the cameras and everything else, that's be, you know the art of war has become much more difficult. So what do they do? They have a battle like this, where they have a dummy battle. The person that is the smart one, the clever one, knows that the opposing side is aggressive. They're coming. And if we go head to head with them, it's gonna be, even if we win, it's gonna be a lot of casualty. So what do we gotta do? We gotta make them think that we're here, but we're really there. How can we make them think? Put dummy, dummy uh, uh, tanks, dummy cannons, dummy things. Put things, obviously well-made plastic tanks, well-made cartons that look like tanks, which according to the uh, satellites and the pictures, it looks like a real tank. Fill the whole field up with it. So when they're doing their scouting, when they're sending their drones to see who, what, when, how, they're seeing, oh, look over there. There's 300 tanks and nobody's prepared. They're just sitting there idle, doing nothing. So what do they do? Oh, we're going to attack them from behind. So they go in there attacking. Well, they don't realize that they're attacking plastic. While they're attacking, they're wasting all their ammunition on the plastic. And the smart, clever army shows up from the back and destroys them. Because they wasted all their ammunition beating on plastic, beating on fake, fake news, right? That's what the Yetzirah does to you. That's what the Yetzirah does to us. The Yetzirah is so clever. He's such a genius. What does he do? He gives you the impression that you have a Muna. Why? He gives you a bunch of like low balls. He gives you a bunch of like, little things, make you think you have a Muna in Bitachon. Why? Listen, uh, I don't know if I'm going to get there on time. I don't know, the bus is coming. Uh, you know what? I have a Munai and Hashem. I'm going to get there on time. And you get there on time. Because worst case scenario, you would have showed up 20 minutes later, 5 minutes later, but you had beat the Khan. Yet Sarah says, you know what? Give, give, give him this one. Make him think that his Emuna really helped him get there on time. Make him think that his Emuna got there on time. Time goes by. Oh, I don't know what I'm going to do. Listen, uh, money's due for the rent in a few days. I don't know if I have any money. I, I'm kind of short if you want your bag. You know what? I beat the Chon Hashem. Hashem's going to send me the money. Yet so I said, ah, ding, ding, ding. Oh, you know what? I got a, got a text message from this guy. He says, yeah, now. give it to him. Give him the money last minute. Make him think that he has beat the Chon. That's the reason. Do, do, do. Little small things. Small little plastic. Little plastic traps. Why? person thinks he has emuna. He reads all the books. He reads Chobot HaLevavot. He reads the Chazonish. He reads the Ramban. He reads the uh, all the Chachamim. He is a bookworm when it comes to emuna and Bitachon. He's an expert. He gives Shilim. He tells people this. Yeah, no, you should have emuna. Why are you worried about this? You should have emuna. Why are you worried about that? You should have Bitachon. Telling everybody emuna, Bitachon, Bitachon, Bitachon. In himself, he doesn't really have anything difficult in his life. Himself, he's just coasting, he's got everything. He's got little things that he thinks he has a because he reads some books and because uh, he, you know, he tells people to do okay. Yetzirah says, all these little battles that you have, that's little plastic. It's little plastic because it's going to make you feel comfortable that you have something. What happens? One day something big happens. A Kadosh Baruch gives a person, you just got fired and nobody wants to hire you. How about that? How about the matters? And on top of that, you just spent your life savings on something that you don't need anymore. Where's your emuna? Where's your emuna, poopy? Where's your emuna? Where's your emuna in Bitachon? What happened to it? Oh, oh. Yetzirah trained you to think that you have emuna in Bitachon. Trained you to think that you have faith in Hashem. Trained you to think that you have confidence in Hashem because you really didn't delve into the thinking. You didn't delve into the teachings. You didn't perfect your midot. You didn't perfect your Torah. You didn't perfect your servitude of Hashem. You thought that if I read enough books, I'm going to be okay. If I just say bitachon, bitachon, bitachon like a mantra, I'm just, I have bitachon. If I can tell everybody that I see, just have emuna and that's going to solve your problems, that means I have emuna. <laughs> Nothing. Bobkis. Push comes to shove. The person is left 
without any ammunition whatsoever because he spent all of it on plastic. And that's what the Yetzirah does. That's what the Yetzirah does, Rabotai Karim. That's how much of a genius he is. But Baruch Hashem, we have Torah. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, even though the Yetzirah is a genius, even though he's strong, even though he's this Barati Yetzirah, Barati Torah Tavlin, even though the Yetzirah is a genius, I also have the solution, the potion to beat the Yetzirah, Torah Tavlin. The potion is the Torah. So now that we know this, now that we know that we can literally live 20, 30, 40, 50 years with fake bitachon, fake bitachon, because we never really had a real big test. Person, Hashem, never had any real test. So instead of taking advantage of the opportunity and working on things even more, what does he do? He coasts. He says, no, no, I have a munah. Look, uh, he... So he says, it's very easy to have this bitachon when... It doesn't play an important part of a person's life. It's easy to speak of bitachon when it's just in theory. Easy to read the books, easy to listen to the shulim, easy to uh, tell people, yeah, have bitachon. It's all theory, theoretical. But not in practice. Not in practice. At times like that, a person is just enjoying beautiful and pleasurable dreams fantasies and as time goes on he fools himself and others into thinking that he indeed possesses greater bitachon in Hashem than his peers when the reality is that he's using this attribute to make his dreams and fantasies of an unknown future more pleasant Chazamis gives us an atomic bomb saying to us, a person could literally be reading every single book about bitachon there is. He could even give lectures to people about bitachon. He could be a person at any time you talk to him, he says, no, I'm Munayin Hashem, I'm Munayin Hashem, I love Hashem, I'm Munayin Hashem. And in reality, he's a faker, not only to other people, to himself. He doesn't even realize himself that he doesn't have anything, that he's nothing. So, how could it be that he has the words that are coming out of his mouth say but in reality in his heart it's empty how could it be where is where, where is he talking about how come it doesn't affect him he says he's just talking about in theory in theory about other people's lives in theory about other situations that are not affecting him so for example Somebody comes to him struggling for money. He says, listen, have him unayin Hashem and everything's going to be okay. When he was struggling for money, he didn't exactly have him unayin bitachon. He started calling his brother and his sister and his cousin and his enemy and his arch enemy and, and, and this one and that one. When he didn't have any money, he called every single person under the sun. He even started going begging for change in the streets because he didn't have any unayin, any bitachon. But when somebody else was struggling, he said, no, no, have him unayin bitachon, everything's going to be okay. That's one way. Another way, he says to us, the person is simply enjoying beautiful and pleasurable fantasies. What does it mean, beautiful? He talks about things that he has bitachon in that are not here, such as the future. Somebody says, listen, aren't you worried about if you, you know, overeat or you smoke or you do this, this and that? When you get older, you're not going to feel good. Or perhaps if you don't save up, you won't have a nest egg in the future. Or perhaps if you don't do this, maybe you won't have teeth. You won't have vision. Well, he said, no, no, no. What? Future? 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now? I love Hashem. I'm going to Hashem. Hashem, Hashem, Hashem. I trust Hashem. He's going to give me a good retirement plan. And he's going to give me uh, all the things that I need when the time comes. Yeah, I'll be the in the future. Yes, we the the future. But how do you know he's a faker? Problems of today, he's struggling, running all over the world, trying to figure out who, what am I going to do? I don't understand. I don't have money to pay the rent. I don't understand. Nobody wants to do this. Nobody wants to call me. Nobody wants to write me. Huh? Well, hold on a second. How do you beat the in the future? It's so far away, so unknown. But the problems of today, you're like sweating bullets. Where's all the conversations, those late night Emunayin bitachon with the beer talks. What happened to that? Don't you remember last time you were right outside that uh, that Emuna Center 
that uh, you know, drinking a couple of beers and uh, saying, "Oh, listen, just have a munai and bitachon Hashem," when you know, don't worry, it's going to be okay. What happened to that? Those types of people, what you'll see very often is they talk about having a munai and bitachon in things that are not here. They're in the future. They're far away. Somebody else's life somebody else's situation not their own situations their own situations they struggle worse than the average person there's actually so much of this that if you get to know people personally it's almost becomes like a, a a sad joke there's actually one particular guy i'm not gonna say his name he's a decent person it's just sad that this is the case i would say 80 percent 80 percent of his talks he's a public figure he talks on the internet and so on 80% of his talks is about emuna and bitachon. Shav emuna, shav bitachon, without emuna, you don't have this, without bitachon, you don't have that. And he, you know, tells people that's like 80%. That's, you know, it's a very uh, popular topic. Sadly, as soon as this coronavirus hit, as soon as the, uh, some other hurricane or something like that hit at the same time, a couple of times already happened. He tells himself, I was so anxious, I didn't know what to do. I was pacing the whole house. He says this on a talk. He says this on a talk. Like he's pretty much telling people, I mean, he shows people he's a human being, but again, I mean, how can you tell everybody in the whole world that you're the leader in Emunai Bitachon, but you're acting like a fool? As if people created the coronavirus and not a Kadush Bolchu. As if people are, as if you have, just. Many times people talk about it in theory, but when it comes, push comes to shove, they have nothing, they have babkis. Why? Because the only way to acquire a munayim bitachon is through the code that the Torah gave us, the instruction that the Torah gave us. You have to perfect your character traits. You have to learn an enormous amount of Torah. You have to make sure you fulfill the mitzvot, and so on and so forth. You, can, you have to obviously go through life's practices, trials and tribulations with an understanding that whatever is happening is the best possible outcome that's available to you in the world. And not just you're hoping for better. And so on and so forth. But in theory, it's very easy. And what ends up happening, Chazuni says, is that he falls for the traps of the Satan. She falls for the traps of the Satan, thinking that she has Emunah, thinking that she has Bitachon, because she... Does a, you know she has a few small things that she thinks oh yeah yeah see I won that battle I I pray that I'm gonna you know uh, I'm gonna have it and I had it because I knew that I was gonna get there on time okay yet I think cares if you get there on time or not yet I is not gonna deal with small things they deal with big things why because that's how he breaks people especially people that hold themselves up as leaders but the person and the people and the community can literally live in a fantasy, in a fantasy for many years, thinking that they actually have bitachon by sharing theoretical exchanges, theoretical conversations about what they would do if they won the lotto, what they would do once they get old, what they would do if they moved to a different place, what they would do if they got married and had kids, and what they would do in the future, what they would do if they could go to the past. Everything theoretical. Real life today, people are scared to leave the house. People are taking Xanax and, 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 and all types of other pills just to make it through the day. Day to day, they can barely survive. The past, future, the unknown, people are as confident as can be about it. This is fake bitachon. Simple. It's not, a, it's not trying to offend anyone. It's a reality. It's what Chazon is saying. It's simply no bitachon. It's just it's a it's a trap of the etzara. So now, what does a real bitachon look like? He says the real test, the real test that can decide whether a person really has bitachon, whether he believes what he's saying. Where in Hebrew he says, in shavin, if his mouth and his heart are equal, meaning they're on the same page. If his mouth and his uh, his heart are on the same page, in essence means if he really believes what he's saying. But it has a little bit of a different meaning. A little bit of a different meaning as far as if his mouth and his heart are on the same page. Why? Because if he believes what he's saying, you can understand that literally. 
But if people eat bo shavin, there's a pasuk in the Torah that it says, um, uh, in his mouth and their uh, uh, in his lips, they gave me kavod, they honored me. Hashem says, but their heart was far away from me. Meaning, they told people, yeah, yeah, we love Hashem, we love Hashem, we love Hashem. But in reality, their heart was rotten. They loved themselves. They were just saying that because they wanted the money. They were just saying that because they wanted a good reputation. They were just saying that because of other interests, other agenda. So. He says that the real test can decide whether a person really believes what he's saying, whether he really does place his bitachon in Hashem, or just trained himself to chirp. Bitachon, bitachon, all the time. He literally says chirp. Now the English translation in this version, it says uh, to speak, but it doesn't say in, in, English, in Hebrew. It says, Oh, is what a bird does, chirp. Why does the Chazonish, the, the rebuke of the Chachamim is so spicy, is you can't believe that they say things like But he says, Mamash, somebody has bitachon or just a little birdie. He just says, bitachon, bitachon, bitachon. He's not talking about somebody who doesn't know anything, ignoramus doesn't know. He's not talking about it. He's talking about somebody that in essence pretends like he knows, pretends like he does, but in reality, he's just mitzvah tzif. He's just like a little bird chirping. Bitachon, bitachon, like the mantra. You know, like the, uh, the the self-help gurus of the world. They say, repeat, 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 and everything's going to be okay. Like that. Why? Because he, the uh, the uh, onkelos, onkelos, one of the chachamim, one of the greatest chachamim we've had, commentary by onkelos, is part of the al-chao, shuchan you have to read the weekly parasha twice with commentary by onkelos. And there's a uh, great Rabbanim, great Gdolim, that says that even if you read Rashi commentary, that's sufficient too. But the point is, Onkelos preceded Rashi. And Onkelos, on Sefer Bereshit, in the beginning, he says that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created man, but man was different than the, uh, than the uh, creatures, because man had Ruach Mimalela. He had a special spirit instilled in him in order to speak. Whereas the other animals, even though they communicate, they're not speaking, they're chirping. They chirp, the birds chirp, 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 chirp. That's, they communicate, they understand each other. And the Sanhedrin, the heads of the Sanhedrin knew what they were even saying, but it's not considered speaking, it's chirping. Mitzvah tzif, makes sounds. But a person, he's a medabil, he speaks. He says so, Chazoni says, is this person, really a Baal Bitachon, that he has Bitachon, when the uh, when a test comes, or he's just a chirper, meaning he's just an animal. He's just like no different than the animals. He has no, he hasn't learned enough to why he hasn't applied enough to 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 really uh, to really become a Medabil, like he's supposed to. He's just like an animal. He says that he does, but he doesn't. He's just chirping. How does he chirp? He says, Bitachon, 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 just as a mantra. Over and over again, he says, Bitachon. And he thinks that just by saying bitachon over and over again, and reading the books, and talking about it, and telling his friends to have it, he thinks that in itself is going to get him bitachon. Because when he says, that's just chirping. Bitachon is not, that's not enough to get bitachon. It's not enough to get bitachon. You need the test, and you need to pass the test, in order to know whether you have bitachon. Now, the amazing thing the amazing thing is is that a kadosh baruch Hu will test a person will test a person to see if he has bitachon if he claims to have bitachon even if he doesn't but needless to say someone that claims to have bitachon will be tested more frequently than someone who doesn't because the pasuk says in uh, Psalms 9411, Adonai Akadosh Baruch Hu knows the thoughts of men, and he knows that they're futile, they're nothing, worthless. So a person that thinks he has bitachon, it's like, no, no, as soon as the test comes, I'm going to do this. If I don't have this, I'm going to do that. If I don't have this, I'm going to do that. He pretends, she pretends, they have all the bitachon in the world. That's like a text message to Hashem. 
Take a WhatsApp. Shem says, what? Okay, hold on a second. Oh, look at that. Says he has bitachon. Says he has bitachon. Okay, let's check. Let's check. Because there's, there's a big reward for having bitachon. It's a big reward for having bitachon. It's a big thing to have bitachon. So he said, you have bitachon? Yeah, let's check. You know, I have people all the time say, listen, I know I have all the bitachon in the world in Hashem, but, listen, if there's a but, don't say quite say you have bitachon yet. You're trying. But don't quite say you have bitachon. Why? Because that bitachon is a big thing. And we want to get there, but we can't give ourselves the illusion that we do already have something that we don't own. Like talking about what we will do with the house and with the building without even buying it. You know, it doesn't really, it doesn't really work out so well in real life. So as soon as a person claims to have bitachon, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, oh, it's a test message. And he, text, he tests the person. He tests the person. He gives them a test. Not to torture them, but to see where do they stand. You said you have bitachon. A lot of things come if you have bitachon. So let's see what happens. And he tests the person. And to see if the person is simply chirping or he's really speaking words of emit. Now, we told you the story some time ago of what bitachon looks like at a moment of truth. Lo alenu lo alechem, but this is not on us and not on you, such a test, but this is what Bitachon looks like in the Sfarim HaKtushim. Rabbeinu Zalman Miladi, the, the Baal Tanya, the one that started Chabad, the original Holy Chabad, was of the opinion, and a very strong opinion, that if Napoleon and his army beat the Russians, although it would, good, it would be good for the Jews financially, especially the rich Jews, it would destroy Judaism. And if the Russians won, it would hurt Jews financially and even potentially hurt them physically because there was racism, there was uh, uh, all types of anti-Semitism by the Russians and so on, but it would be good for the neshama. It would be good for the neshama, it would preserve Judaism because what's a better preserver of us than anti-Semitism? Reality is, anti-Semitism is one of the main things that unites Jews more than anything else in the world. Aside from Torah, anti-Semitism, from, my, from what, just what I'm thinking right now, aside from Torah, Tosha, I don't think anything unites Jews more than anti-Semitism. Why? Because when, the Goi- when we hate each other, that's obviously lack of unity. But when the Goim hate us, they hate all of us. Whether you're this one, whether you're that one, you're a black one, you're a green one, you're a burgundy one, you're from the Mizrach, you're from the Arab, you're from uh, Israel, you're from America. When the Goim hate us, all of a sudden, they hate all of us and we're forced to be united. Now, Rabbeinu Zalman Miladin says, if the Russians win, yeah, it's going to be anti-Semitism, but it's going to unite the Jews. If Napoleon wins, then the Jews are going to continue doing extremely well and there's going to be increased increased uh, uh, financial success, more disunity among the Jews, more uh, intermarriage, more chilul Hashem, more bad things. So what do we have to do? We have to help the Russians, even though that means we're putting our life on the line. So Rabbi Uzanan sends one of his chassidim to go to the army of Napoleon. And this guy goes up the ladder because there's a lot of wars, there's a lot of action in Napoleon's army every day. He's trying to conquer the world. And little by little he is. And this Hasid goes up the chain and uh, gets the attention of Napoleon. And Napoleon likes him and he makes him one of his main guys. All the while this Hasid is giving all of the secrets to the Russians. And now when Napoleon is actually getting to a point where he's starting to fight the Russians, he sees he's losing a lot of battles, he's losing a lot of men, and he says, there has to be a spy in my army. There has to be a spy. Now, we're losing too many battles, as if they know where we're going to go. So he gets his main guys in a circle, and he says, I know that one of you is a spy. I know that one of you is a spy. And he grabs one guy, puts his hand on his chest, and he sees the guy's heart thumping like a rat like a pretty much like it's a he can't uh, i can't believe that he just picked him out and he caught him he kills him on the spot chops his head off next guy i know it's you touches his head sees his uh, heart he's beating says oh you're guilty too kills him too next one kills him too then he gets to the hasid 
he sees the Hasid, the Chabadnik, his heart is as calm as, ooh, like he's on retirement. And he says to him, you I trust. The rest of these people are scared and they're probably guilty. You I trust. So later on when the Hasid told the story, he said, how did you do it? How did you do it? How did you have, I mean, you're the only one that's probably guilty in there. Maybe some others too, but you for sure are guilty. You know you're guilty of, of, of treason and going against him. How are you so calm? How is your heart? I mean, listen, to have a face is one thing, but your heart is not even pumping. That means that you have 100% confidence he's not going to catch you. The Chabadnik, the holy Chabadnik says something unbelievable. He says, what? What should I be worried about? The Rebbe told me, the Rebbe told me, that someone that's on a mission of a mitzvah will not get hurt. Shluchei mitzvah enam nizuki. Someone that's on a mission of doing a mitzvah can't get hurt. Won't get hurt. Now you can say, oh yeah, but that's, uh, you know, Chachamim said it, the, the, the rabbi said it. No, no, no. To this chassid, to someone that understands what these words mean, that's not just words put together to make a sentence. It's a reality. It's a reality. That is taking the emunah, that's a general emunah, and applying it to real life and making it a reality. That's what bitachon is. Bitachon is at the moment of truth, when you know that everything is wrong as far as the way it looks, but you know HaKadosh Baruch is running the show. He said it, he'll do it. This Rabotai is one of the most extraordinary things that a person can gift themselves. Can gift themselves this Emunah and Bitachon. Now, to have Bitachon in the future is fantastic, so long as you also have just as much or even more bitachon in the present. But if you only have bitachon in the future, but not in the present, that means that your bitachon is really fake bitachon. Or better said, almost non-existent. Almost non-existent. Because to have bitachon in theoretical future variables, things that, that you really are out of your reach, it's very easy. That's a trap of the satan to make you think you have bitachon. The real equation, the real issue, the real uh, 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 test, I should say, is having it in your day-to-day -day life, perhaps especially when everything looks dark. Now, the Chazonish does not skip a beat telling us that the real test can, that can decide whether a person really has bitachon and really has what he's saying, and whether he really does place his bitachon in Hashem or just has trained himself to chirp saying bitachon, bitachon all the time, without it being really part of him, is when he meets up with the situation that demands that he is indeed places trust in Hashem. Dega Shelemet, we call it. The moment of truth. The moment of truth arrives, the big test, Hashem Yishmo. It could be a disease. It could be a major financial loss. It could be a relationship problem. It could be all types of major tests that a person has in their life, which many times break people and sometimes make them who they really are. That moment of truth is when you'll find out whether you truly have bitachon in Hashem or whether it was just you chirping. At such a time, the role of bitachon is to guide his actions, heal and soothe him. If the person truly has bitachon, that moment of truth, he will be as comfortable as he was when his mom was holding him as a baby. That's what real bitachon looks like. That's what it feels like. He has a test. He has a bunch of scary letters that arrived at his house. He has a bunch of scary situations medically. He has a bunch of scary situations financially, and so on and so forth. He has all of these different problems. But he says, everything's going to be okay. Everything's not going to be okay. Not because I think everything I'm going to win everything I'm going to do. Because it's coming from Abba. And I feel Abba holding me just as tightly today as he did yesterday. And perhaps maybe even a little tighter. 
just to make sure I don't get lost. That's the moment of truth. That's the moment of truth. And Chazoni says, does he turn to the trait of bitachon, of trust, and actually trust in Hashem? Or does he particularly at this time not make use of it, turning instead to unreliable mortal allies or useless and ignoble strategies? Moment of truth comes. Do you trust the Kadosh Baruch Hu? Or all of a sudden, the phone, give me a phone, I need to borrow a phone, start making phone calls. No, 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 we need to do this. No, what? What? No, it's my Ishtadlut. Okay, you're right. You're supposed to do some Ishtadlut, but are you guilty of a little bit too much Ishtadlut? Like, there's Ishtadlut of praying tailing. You know, your effort, praying tailing. That's really what Rav uh, uh, Steinemann said. They asked him, what, what is, what is Ishtadlut? He said, praying tailing. That's Ishtadlut. That's enough already. There's obviously him. Okay, you can pray Tehilim. Read some Tehilim. You have a problem. You have financial issues. You have health issues. You have this issue. You have that Pray to Kadosh Baruch That's Yishtadlut. Then there's Yishtadlut, you know, okay, getting a second job. Okay, it's a little bit too much. I mean, is, uh, is your second job going to kill your Torah time? Because if your first job, you already barely are, you know, able to learn Torah for two, three hours a day, you have a second job now, that means you're not going to have any time to learn Torah. So that's, 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 that's too much Yishtadlut. Surely you do realize that HaKadosh Baruch Hu didn't create you in order to work two jobs. He created you to learn Torah. Yeah, but if I were, I only, guys going to tell you, yeah, but if I only work this one job, Hashem is not giving me enough money. That's exactly where Bitachon comes in. That's where Bitachon comes in. No one says that you're not allowed to work. You're allowed to work. You should work. But are you overworking? Are you guilty of too much Ishtenlut? To the point where you're killing yourself and you're killing your own Bitachon in your own hands. If a person, at a moment of truth, at a difficult time, he's not going to apply all of this theoretical bitachon that he had. And at those times, he's going to say, no, no, let me uh, try to use uh, some friends and family and, and this one and that one to, to, to help me out. And uh, he starts relying on, 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 on people instead of on Hashem. He starts doing all types of awful things. I mean, this one particular religious guy has a big test, Shem I mean, it's a, uh, I mean, Hashem never give us such tests, but had a very big test. And uh, in so many words, he's a religious from guy. Everything, uh, you know, from the visual perspective of it, looks clean. But because he had such a big test and uh, his bitachon was lacking, he says himself, he went to some, Arab witch went to some Arab witch says listen can you do me a witchcraft to remove all the curses and the problems in my life imagine imagine such a scene a from Hasidish looking guy goes to an Arab witch to, to get curses out of his life this unfortunately Abu Tayyip, is not a one-time story there's many stories like this I have many people tell me that they're from tell me to keep Shabbat tell me to keep mitzvot but they also tell me that they're involved in witchcraft I know first-hand story, first-hand story, one particular guy was a uh, supposedly, uh, I don't know if it was a rabbi or not, but definitely very active, very active in the religious community, also well-to-do in business. He went and used witchcraft, witchcraft for something like 10 years straight. He would go to the same woman every uh, month or every week to do all types of witchcraft for him, to tell him what to do with his business deals. The guy comes with the keeper and the tefillin and everything. Goes to the witch every, literally every month. Asuba to us, it's forbidden. It creates all types of uh, horrible things, it's forbidden. But the guy, so listen, he went one time, he saw good results, she told him, he told him that if he does this, this and that, good things are going to happen. He tried it, it worked out, he figured, oh, that's my rabbi now. That's my rabbi now. That's my uh, bitachon now. Guess what? Aside from it being forbidden according to the Torah, a huge, huge sin, aside from that, by doing that, a person is destroying their own emunah and bitachon. They're destroying because now they're figuring, no, no, I don't need to have emunah and bitachon. I can just go to this person. I don't need to have emunah and bitachon. I can just call him and he'll save me. I can call her and she'll save me. Now, where does this 
where does this really stem from? Because to just say when push comes to shove, you know, pass the test, everything's going to, you know, entrust in Hashem, it's easy to say. That's what the Chazun is. It's easy to say. But really what would help us if we only knew what causes us to fail. To just say, just have emunah and be tachon in Hashem and be a champion, be a tzaddik, that's great. Thank you very much. It's not really going to help me though. Tell me the root of my problem. Tell me why do I keep failing when push comes to shove. I read Chobot Alevavot. I read the Chazonish. I read this one. I read that one. I watch the lectures every week and, and, and I keep failing. The guys, you know, to, to, Rabbi, tell, okay, fine. You tell me how I'm going be Tachon. Every Rabbi tells me how I'm going be Tachon. I'm watching lectures every day. I wake up in the morning and I'm be And I go. And I watch it and I say, yeah, Rabbi, I'm going to be Tachon. I'm going be Tachon. I'm going be Tachon. At some point during that month, some bomb explodes in front of my face and then Munai and Bitachon explodes with it. Why do I keep failing? Baruch Hashem, we have the answer. Not me. The Gaon Mivina. The Gaon Mivina, Rabotai Karim, says that there's a verse in the Torah, there's a verse in the Torah that's perhaps one of the most manipulated verses in the secular world today. Why? Because people simply want to do whatever they want. They don't want to learn Torah, so they make up whatever they want. There's a verse in the Torah that says, Tzaddik be'emunato yichye. Tzaddik be'emunato yichye is in Habakkuk chapter 2, verse number 4, which means that a righteous person, a tzaddik, shall live through his emunah. Now, the secular people, especially in the Israeli world, they say, Ish be'emunah A person will live with his own emunah, meaning that everybody has, you have your belief, I have my belief, everybody has their beliefs, everybody will do whatever they want. That's the secular-minded, trying to find how to, uh, some verse, manipulate it, to just change one word, instead of tzaddik, put ish, doesn't sound so bad, but it changes the meaning completely. Ish ben Munatayich means pretty much everybody can just do whatever they want. You have your belief. I have one of my beliefs, like the Americans say, live and let live. You live your life, I live my life. You leave me alone, I leave you alone. There's no such thing in Judaism. There is no such thing in Ish ben Munatayich. A person will live with his own emunah. No such thing. Tzaddik ben Munatayich has a completely different meaning. And it doesn't mean that the righteous person has emunah and that's why he's going to live. No. The Gaumi Vilna. The Gaon of Vina says that a tzaddik, a tzaddik is a person that has perfected his neshama, perfected his neshama to the, to the point that's connected with his desire to have more. He's perfected his neshama. A tzaddik et nafsho b'midat ha'istabkut. He is perfected his neshama in regards to the character trait of simply being satisfied with what he has. And he's gone to the point where it's he's the opposite of a desiring person. Meaning, whatever he has, he's perfectly fine with. That's what Sadiq the Gamivina says. What's an example of that? Rav Mordechai Eliyahu, Allah wa Shalom, before he became the Rishon Tzion, many people respected him, but money and so on wasn't exactly for flourishing. So the driver that would take him to his shirin was a regular person, and his car was like one of those cars from the, you know, the first cars ever made, just that it hasn't been updated. So when it drove down the road, the whole neighborhood, three blocks away, knew also. Tiny little taranta, you know, makes a lot of noise. Pretty much you have to pray for it to turn on, pray even harder for it to stop, you know, that kind of uh, vehicle. So that's what take him. Al Mordechai Eliyahu, wherever he went, you knew exactly where he was because he, there was his, his driver would take him. And it was a volunteer, wasn't it? Uh, anyway, 
he took him, and one day, the Ramon de Chayliyahu was selected to become the Rishon Etzion, the head rabbi of Israel. So at that point, first of all, there's a salary that comes with it. Second of all, there's a lot more recognition. So the Safra family, very uh, wealthy, I believe, uh, Syrian family, they uh, give a lot of kavod to Rabbanim. So donated a million dollar car, or a million, uh, million shekel car. In Israel, everything is like four times the price. But it's a high-end car. I think it was like a BMW or Mercedes, which in those days was still uncommon. In essence, the equivalent of like $300,000 in American money. A million shekel car, donated to Rabbi, brand new car, and so on. So after one of the events, the rabbi comes, and you have this beautiful car, pristine, the leather is still saying moo, still so fresh. And then all of a sudden, the car that, you know, from, 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 the, from the past, but it's still alive, shows up, and Ramo de Chaliyahu starts walking towards his regular car. He said, no, 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 come on, come on. It's your new car. This is your new car. You go to this one. He goes, no, what do I need this car for? No, no, I have this one. I have this one. It's good. He goes, no, but for the God, this car is like, you know, it's, 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 it's five dollars away from being a plane. Drive this one. This is nice. It's quiet. It's nice. He goes, no, this one is perfectly fine. I'm used to the chairs. I'm used to everything. He goes, yeah, but for the God, it's a, uh, so noisy. He goes, yeah, Boch Hashem. I'm used to the noise. Well, even the Kohen Gadol, they tell us says that every walking makes some noise with the bells. On his uniform. Oh, Hashem. No, but for the Rav, it's not kavod for the Torah. It's such a car for the Rishon Letzion, the head rabbi of Israel. It's not kavod. This is a garbage pail that goes from one place to another. And this is a garbage pail that goes from one place to another. They're both garbage pails. That's midat istabkut. That's having perfected the desiring character trait. That's when a person has simply perfected their trait of desiring things. Because as we all know, one of the Ten Commandments is lo tachmod. Do not desire. Don't desire your neighbor's wife. Don't desire his house either. Don't desire his money. Don't desire his account. Don't desire his anything. Not allowed to be jealous of anybody. Lo tachmod. The Gaon Vilna gives us something extraordinary here. He says that a person that's a tzaddik has perfected this desire to the point that he's happy with whatever he has. And then he continues saying, Ba'ala bitachon, someone that owns bitachon is the opposite of someone that has desires. Meaning that a person that has perfected this trait to become tzaddik is also Baal Bitechon. Why? Because if he's Baal Bitechon, he's happy with whatever he has. If he's happy with whatever he has, he has no desire for anything else. Why? Because whatever HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave me, Ishtabach Shemola'a, thank you very much, my little Taranta, thank you for my big house, thank you for my small house, thank you for the small chair, thank you for the big chair, thank you HaKadosh Baruch Hu for whatever I have, Ishtabach Shemola'a. He has no desires for anything more than what HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives him because he knows that whatever HaKadosh Baruch Hu gave him, that's the best possible thing. That's a gift from Abba. What can he get better than that? He has no desires for anything that he doesn't have. None whatsoever. That's a tzaddik. That's a tzaddik. A person that has come to the point where he controls his desires. He doesn't walk by his neighbor's house and starts measuring up his house and says, you know what? This house... I, I'm gonna get this house. No, this is this is better for me than for him. He looks at the guy's car. He goes, "Guy probably stole it. How did he buy this car?" He starts desiring other people's stuff. Jealousy starts saying, "Lashon." All types of bad things come from desire. That's out of control. Now you're allowed to be ambitious. You're allowed to be ambitious, but what are you ambitious about? Are you ambitious about more materialism? A bigger house you can show off. A nicer car so you could uh, show off more money so you can buy more things to make sins with or are you ambitious to more the pigmara more mitzvot more torah a bigger house to have more guests for 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 shabbat for holidays to have what do you des are you desiring these materialistic things 
for sins, for recognition, for kavod, or are you desiring them for mitzvot? Don't say, no, no, I want a big house, I'm going to have guests, and you have guests once a year. The reality is a person needs to know why he desires what he desires. And if a person lives his life in such a way where he's constantly more, 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 he just can never have enough, is a very sick person. But worse yet, aside from being sick, he is self-destructing his bitachon. Because the Gaumi Vilna says, to have bitachon, you have to become a tzaddik. What's a tzaddik? A tzaddik is somebody that's content and happy and ecstatic with whatever is on his plate. If there's three peas on his plate, Ishtabach Shimo, thank you very much. If there's 400 with a steak next to it, it's the same exact thank you very much. It's the same exact thank you very much. This is one of the most amazing traits that a person can gift themselves, at least to aspire to become like that. Because if, if a person is constantly going to chase more and more and more stuff, the Gemara in Masechet Sukkah says, Oyev kesef lo yizba kesef. Someone that loves money is never going to have enough money. Someone that is simply desiring more material, more and more and more, and, and, and literally tries to acquire every materialistic ambition that he or she has, they'll never have enough. This goes with every aspect of a person's life. So much so that the Gaumi Vilna right now, also this chidush that he gave us, that the, the lack of control of desire is what actually makes a person not a tzaddik. In essence, what he's also telling us in nicer terms is that if the person doesn't know how to control his desire, that's an asha. If every time he sees something, ah, how much you pay for that? How much you pay for that? Wow, yeah. Oh, I'm going to get one. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I'm gonna, everything, everything. How much? How much? Where? Mm, eh, eh, everything. He wants his hand in everything. That's a rasha. That's a rasha. How do we know for sure that's a rasha? How do we know this is something Kadosh who hates? Maybe it's just an elective. You know, some people say, listen, you know, I, I believe in Hashem, but I don't have, uh, you know, bitachon like you. Like as if it's like, uh, you know, an elective. This is an obligation. How do we know it's an obligation? Because we, obviously we all know that we're not allowed to be reshaim. Uh, so how do we know? Kadosh Baruch Hu tells Moshe Rabbeinu, ten times, ten times your people have tested me. Ten times they tested me in the desert. What they tested, every one of the tests is bitachon test. Every one of the tests is a bitachon test, like Kadosh Baruch Hu says. They didn't believe in me that I was going to give them manna. They didn't believe in me that I'm going to give them water. They didn't believe in me that I was going to save them from the Egyptian. They didn't believe in me in this and this and that. Ten times they tested Hashem. Now the Gaumi Vilna says, what is lack of bitachon? Lack of bitachon means it's only, it only happens because we're chomdim. We want other stuff that we don't have. We lack bitachon because we're not happy with what we have because we're too busy wanting something else. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu says he almost destroyed us ten times because we didn't trust him. Not because we didn't trust him, but because we were violating the Ten Commandments. One of them is Lot Achmod. Don't desire other things. In reality, Bitachon has something to do with every one of the Ten Commandments. Whether it's the, I'm the only God took you out of Egypt, or don't believe in idols and keep Shabbat. Every one of those mitzvot has something connection to Bitachon. You know, if you don't have bitachon, you'll work on Shabbat because you don't believe that uh, you'll have enough money during the first six days. If you don't have bitachon Hashem, you're probably not going to believe that he's the one that took us out of Egypt. You figured that it was uh, some type of, uh, you know, uh, a civil war or something. If you don't have bitachon, you'll fall for some idolatry if post comes to shove like this religious guy just said. If you don't have bitachon, you'll curse God because, uh, you know, you, you're not happy with what he gives you. You don't have bitachon, you'll steal. You don't have bitachon, you'll curse your parents. You don't have bitachon, you'll do everything wrong. But specifically and directly and precisely, HaKadosh Baruch Hu says, you didn't have bitachon. And the Gaumi Vimna says, what does it mean not having bitachon? Not having bitachon, it's only because you're too busy wanting what you don't have. She has a nice dress. Instead of saying a compliment, wow, you're so tsnua, you're so modest, you look good in this, what are you saying? Psh, I look better in that dress. How much you pay for that dress? Where'd you get that dress? What do you care what she gets that dress? 
Why, why don't you just give her a nice word and that's it? Why do you care so much about everything else? Why are you so busy about wanting to buy everything and get your hands in everything? Why aren't you just happy with your dress, your job, your money, your house, your stuff? Yeah, but I don't have like her. So why do you not have like her? Who says that you're supposed to have like her? Who says you're supposed to have like everybody else? What is this, communism? Everybody has the same exact thing, except the leaders. People have to understand that when you're so busy desiring other people's stuff, it makes you an evil person. It makes you an evil person by default. Why? Because you're constantly jealous of other people, which the Gemara says anyone that's jealous is not going to be resurrected with the dead. But that's because jealousy and desiring other people's stuff is kfila. It's heresy. It's heresy. It's a degree of heresy because having jealousy, desiring stuff that she has and he has and everything that everybody else has and not what you have is heresy because in essence it's telling Akadosh Baruch Hu, you made a mistake. You gave her what you were supposed to give me. You gave him what you were supposed to give me. That's heresy. That's telling Akadosh Baruch Hu, you made a mistake. And that's what Ami said failed at. In a desert ten times. They kept mentioning, look, in Egypt we had this. They sold themselves a delusion. As if they had good stuff back then. That's how focused they were about other stuff and not what they have. They forsake the good that Hashem gave them because they were too busy desiring something else that's not in, that's, that they don't have. And this Amutai is one of the things that a person can easily fix. Easily fix. Stop looking at other people's profiles on Facebook. Stop looking at their pictures. Stop looking at other people's lives. Stop reading about celebrities' lifestyles and watching shows about their life. Stop asking everybody the price they paid for stuff. Stop asking people if they bought or they rent the house. Stop asking people financial questions and measuring and sizing people up. Simply stop it. Best yet, stop talking about people that you know or people you don't know, but in a, in a way where you're talking about their stuff. It's literally the lowest form of conversation. When a person has nothing intellectual to say, all he says is stuff about other people that's not relevant to him in any way. The fact that he or she bought a new house or has a big house or has a new wife or has four kids or has no kids, it has no impact on your life whatsoever. To talk about it means you have literally zero in your brain. It's the lowest form of conversation. But in addition to that, if that's not enough, it's a sin that actually makes a person evil within a short period of time. Why? Because you get yourself used to talking about other people and therefore you have to think about other people and therefore you have to start desiring what they have what they don't have you know competing against them and you forget the gifts that HaKadosh Baruch Hu gives you you forget it you forget your connection to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. you forget HaKadosh Baruch Hu even exists you can go pray in a Bekneset and not think about Hashem for two minutes why? you're too busy looking at his new talit you're too busy looking at this tefillin and see, wow, it's a new box. It's silver. Wow, where do you get that from? How much did it cost? Malama Sechet Shabbat says you're not allowed to have any thoughts other than a Kadosh Bahu when you have tefillin on. Why, why are you so busy? Sometimes you have people that are so busy, so busy looking at other people's stuff that they start showing off as a result of it to make it seem as if they're doing okay also. So what do they do? They go to shul, they put on their tefillin, and they take selfie pictures of themselves to show people like they're doing well, they're doing their righteous, and they have a new tefillin on, and they have a new talit on. Habibi, you're not allowed to do that. You're not thinking about Hashem when you're taking a selfie. You're not thinking about Hashem when you're comparing yourself to everybody else. Having a tefillin on is literally having a FaceTime conversation with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And you're worried about a selfie? Why? Desiring other people's stuff. When you desire other people's stuff, which is, again, it doesn't even have to necessarily be a specific person. Just stuff you don't have, you are constantly trying to keep up with the Joneses. You're constantly trying to show the world that you're not so far behind, or perhaps maybe you're even ahead. This literally ruins a person's life 
because it'll never be enough. Because the only thing that's enough is Hashem. When you have Hashem in your life, whatever you have is perfect. Why? Because the Kodosh Baruch is perfect. When you don't have Hashem in your life, nothing will ever be enough. Nothing will ever be enough. Now, even if you say you have Hashem in your life, and like I said, you can even be a speaker and a rabbi, you know, all stuff, and still be a cheater in business, and still be a liar when it comes to your beliefs. Why? Because sometimes people don't do enough introspection, self-checking, to know where they really stand. They're too busy measuring everybody else. Sometimes it's a completely different spectrum. I have many people, all day they tell me how much they hate other people. Oh, I hate Jewish people, and he's a Jew. Oh, I hate women, and she's a woman sometimes, or he needs to get married to one. Oh, I hate this. Oh, I hate this. Oh, I hate, I hate, all of them, they hate people. What? Khabibi, look at yourself. Look at yourself. Yeah, but you talk about other people, Rabbi. I warn people about other people. I don't talk about other people just to make it entertaining. I warn you so you don't fall. I tell you about a hole that's in the road that you may not be aware of because you're paying attention to your world and I happen to be a person that crossed that road. So I'm telling you, there's a hole in the road. Don't walk over it. Simple. You are too focused on other things. You talk about other people, you hate other people, and your whole life is focused on other people. You're ruining your life. Why? Because your life is simply missing you. It's missing yourself. You're talking, you're worried about everybody else's stuff, everybody else's life, everybody else's things, and not yourself. And that can easily make a person not only miserable, not only unhappy, but worse yet, can make a person evil. Now, the Chovot HaLevavot, written some around 900 years ago, in Shara Bitachon, in Shara Bitachon, says some pretty explosive things. In the intro, in the uh, fourth section of the uh, Chovot HaLevavot, Duties of the Heart, in the fourth section, he talks about Bitachon, but in perhaps one of the deepest write-ups about bitachon that exists. And he says the following, Among the benefits to him in a religious life is the tranquility of the soul in reliance on God may be exalted, as the servant is bound to rely on his master. For if a person does not put his trust in God, he places his trust in what is other than God. And whoever trusts in what is other than God God removes his providence from him and leaves him in the hands of whatever he trusts in. So first and foremost, the Chavot HaLevavot, the Rabbeinu Bechayin says, one of the greatest things about having Bitachon Hashem and living this religious life is that you have a situation where you have, you're calm, you're collected. And actually at the end, at the end of this section, he says that the only people that he has ever found and knows to have actual happiness are people that have bitachon. He says it's not possible to have happiness without bitachon because bitachon is in essence understanding that HaKadosh Baruch Hu runs the world and therefore you should be perfectly happy with whatever you have. If you don't have bitachon, then in essence you're either a victim of not understanding and thinking that everything is against you or perhaps you're anxious because you have no idea what's going on. So when you have bitachon, he says that that's how you get the happiness. But even before he gets it, the introduction he says one of the benefits is that you have this tranquil life because you, because you rely on Hashem, because you rely on God. Because as a servant to his master, ser servant relies on his master. He doesn't have to worry about food because he knows his master is going to feed him. He doesn't have to worry about where to live because he knows his master is going to give him a place to live. That's what a person is supposed to do. But what if a person doesn't have it? He says, poor person. Why? Because you have to have a belief in somebody. There's no such thing as a belief in nothing. Even the atheist is a religion. Atheism is a religion. They believe in nothing. Believing in nothing is a belief. And he says that if a person does not believe and doesn't trust in Hashem, then that means he trusts in something other than Hashem, which in essence is idol worship. He trusts in something else. He trusts in another person. He trusts in another uh, anything other than Hashem. And that trust in anything other than Hashem makes Hashem leave that person 
removes himself from that person and leave that person in that truck in that items uh uh hands meaning you trust in people hashem leaves you in the hands of people now this is as atrocious as can be just to give you guys an understanding many times many uh jews during the time of before the holocaust wanted to be more german and they wanted to be jews so many so much so that many of them even fought in the army of hitler now it was 150,000 jews it wasn't like five jews 150,000 Jews fought in the army of Hitler. That means that they wanted to be German more than they wanted to be Jews. And this 150,000 weren't the only ones. Many of them that wanted to be, they just weren't chosen. And instead were killed. But the point being is that many Jews consider themselves more German than they did Jews. It's like, unfortunately, many Jews today feel themselves more American than they feel as Jews. And the Kadosh Baruch Hu punished us severely for it. Where he says, because we had too much faith in the Germans, too much faith in people, Hashem left us in their hands at Hashem Ishmo. So this is not a uh, just a suggestion by Rabbeinu Bechaye that, oh, you shouldn't have faith in other things. This is, in essence, a warning. A warning that Bitachon is not an elective. It's something that you must toil as much as possible to acquire as quickly as possible, as soon as possible. Because this is one of the things that could literally determine whether a person goes to heaven or not now he continues and he pro- provides some some sources he says jeremiah chapter 17 verse 7 blessed is the man who trusts in god who makes god his refuge then he brings another one in psalms blessed is the man who made god his trust and did not turn to the arrogant or those that stray after falsehood then he brings another verse in jeremiah cursed is the man who trusts in man and makes flesh his strength while his heart turns away from god so he brings countless sources one after another after another to pretty much warn us not to have any faith whatsoever in people not to have any faith in any individual person yes you could befriend certain people you could ask them for guidance you could even ask them for for help or for, for in different things but to think that the salvation will come from an individual person or even a group of people versus a kadosh is a mistake it's a mistake and a half this is also part of the reason why i think that Am Yisrael has a very very serious problem because of all of the faith that they put in different politicians whether it be donald trump or bb netanyahu or the likes this is a very big mistake it's been so much so that even though perhaps both of them have done good things for the jewish people to a certain extent it got to the point of too much too much people know more about donald trump than they know about the torah people know more about bibi netanyahu than they know about parashat shavua but the weekly parasha it's a sad scenario same thing goes with different uh, athletes and celebrities and so on it's not a good thing to have so much knowledge about people and virtually nothing and no faith whatsoever in the connection of god rabbi nubachaya continues says if he relies on his great wealth it'll be taken from him and left to someone else as it says in scripture in the uh, torah in the uh, book of yob 27 19 he lies down the rich and it's not and it's not taken away he opens his eyes and it's gone people think that the only way to 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 have their wealth be gone as if they lose everything the book of job and many other places that he brings here says no 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 you're mistaken you're thinking that punishment would be that hashem will simply take the rich guy's money because he doesn't give enough staka he'll take the rich guy's money because he doesn't keep shabbat that's the mistake you're making no he'll just take the rich guy from the money he doesn't take the money away the money stays just the rich guy goes away the rich girl goes away she's gone he opens his eyes and the money's gone what does it mean he opens his eyes and the money's gone the person dies and opens their eyes in the real world not this world where the real world where money doesn't count so what happens to all the money the verse says the money is given to the righteous the people that need it and it says in the uh Kohelet, shlomo Amelech says chapter 2 verse 26 but to the rasha to the uh to the sinner he gives the work of gathering and amassing the money to hand over to one who is good before God. 
Meaning that it'll sometimes have the wicked people go and gather the money, go work, open a company, open a business, do deals, do trade, do this, do that, make a bunch of money, but he's not going to let them enjoy it. What's the punishment? They go make all the money. They don't have any bitachon. They thought they're going to make all the money. They're going to beat the system. They're going to beat God with all their money. Then a Kadosh says, okay, you gathered enough. Good for you. Okay, yeah. They're out of this world and all of the money they have left, they meet all their life is given to righteous people. Now this may take a while. This may doesn't necessarily go from uh, from him to the rabbi. It doesn't go from him for, to the Egun Bezot Hashem. But the point being is that a Kadosh Baruch Hu doesn't necessarily punish people just by making them lose money. But rather he makes them gather the money and doesn't allow them to benefit from it. So the person, why do these why why does specifically talk about such people? Because because people that are overly focused on materialism, overly focused on 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 money, it's only because they're constantly chomdin, they're constantly jealous of other people, they're constantly looking at other people's stuff. So therefore, they become obsessed with stuff. And they become obsessed with competing with other people that have stuff. So much so, they forget about learning Torah, they forget about doing mitzvot, they forget about having a purpose in the world. Their whole life is about acquiring stuff. Forgetting that they didn't come to this world just to acquire stuff. And a Kadosh Baruch Hu punishes those people and says, okay, even if you win, you still lose. Meaning, even if you get all the stuff that you want, and you're the kid with all of the toys, in the end, the punishment will be that you won't even enjoy the toys. You won't get to play with them. Somebody else will play with them. That's the punishment. Imagine how much suffering. It's To me, it seems even worse than gain over. Imagine a person... His whole life, 60, 70, 80 years, works 12, 15, 18 hours a day just to make money, 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 money. Gathered a bunch of money. Then finally he says, you know what, I'm going to retire. Drops dead. Then he has to live the rest of eternity looking at other people spending the money that he worked for. He never enjoyed it for a penny, for a second. I mean, that's, that might as well be Gainal. And that's in essence what Rabbeinu Bechayi says. All of this happens as a result of not having bitachon. Why? Because having desires for other people's stuff is the opposite of bitachon. And then he continues and says, another advantage of having bitachon is that it has the following effect, where one that has bitachon in Hashem will not submit to another. He will not set his hopes in any man or put his trust in human beings He'll not be subservient to them or, or in order to win their favor, meaning he's not going to be a kiss-up. Nor will he flatter them. He's not going to be one of those people that just, oh, tzaddik, tzaddik, everybody's great, and so on. No. He will not agree with them in what is not the service of God. He's not going to say, no, you know what? Let's agree to disagree. No. You're wrong or you're right. Bottom line. No such thing. Their ways will not frighten him, and he will not be afraid to oppose them. He will divest himself of their finery, of their favors, and free himself from the burden of expressing gratitude to them and the obligation of repaying them. When rebuking them, he will not shrink from offending them. If he humiliates them, he will not be timid before them or adorn what is false. Here he is, in essence, trying to tell us one of the greatest benefits of having bitachon is that you're free. You're free from thinking about what do people think about me. All you care about is what does Hashem think about me? Because when you think about what people think about you all the time, then if the guy is rich, you don't want to offend him. And if the guy is powerful, you don't want to do this. And if the girl is pretty, you don't want to do that. And if the girl... All the, you have all this junk in your head which causes you to like think 500 times before you take a step. When you have bitachon, that means you're connected to Hashem. If you're connected to Hashem, that means you have a lot of Torah. If you have a lot of Torah, you don't have to worry about everybody else. Why? All you have to worry about is what is true, what is false. What is right, what is wrong, according to Hashem. If what you're doing is right according to Hashem, it doesn't matter what anybody thinks. It doesn't matter if they're going to donate or not. It doesn't matter if they're going to agree with you or not. It doesn't matter if you're popular or not. It doesn't matter if they like you or don't like you. Why? Because you know a Kadosh Baruch Hu likes you because you're connected to him. This, in essence, again, we're going to go over it a little bit more in the other next year, but this, again, is another 
beautiful benefit of having bitachon in your life. You're free from the burden of other people. You're free from the burden of having other people's opinions of you simply control your life. Surely, sometimes people's opinions are value when, when they mean well and so on, but I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about simply being scared to move in your life because you're scared of this or that from other people as if they're running the world, as if he's the one that's going to hire or fire you in the world. Only a Kadosh Baruch Hu runs the world. Only a Kadosh Baruch Hu runs the world. And that's one of the things that Rabbeinu Bichaya says at the end. He says, listen, if you have true bitachon, you'll be able to acquire happiness. You'll be able to acquire happiness that is simply something that's rarer than a blue diamond. In today's world, there's a lot of people pretending to be happy. A lot of people that are pretending to have all types of good things. But when you look deeper inside their lives, you realize that many times they have a run life. They have a run life, a run, uh, a run behind the scenes. Now, in order to get happy, you have to have bitachon. Now, one of the things that a person needs to do in order to acquire bitachon is to not fail. That's already more than half the battle. Not fail at desiring other people's stuff or things that you don't have. You can pray for things. You can pray to get a wife. You can pray to have a husband. You can pray to have kids. You can pray to have good things if there's a source of Kedusha and a real reason of you wanting it for a good reason. You can pray for Panasah. You can even pray for a big house and having nice things, but it has to have a real reason other than just showing off or competing with other people. But more so than that, you should not be a hater when you see other people having better things than you. You should be happy for people and don't have an evil eye. Because when you have an evil eye, by default, you're killing your own bitachon. It makes you a person that has no bitachon. It actually makes you a person that has the opposite. A person that has, uh, he's a hamdan. He's a desiring person. He's a person that's jealous and wants to acquire other people's stuff, which is not a good trait to have. And because in essence, it's a, if not outright heresy, it is at least the dust of heresy. It's a dust of heresy because, in essence, it's telling Hashem that he made a mistake. So now what happens when push comes to shove and a person has these tests? He has to obviously already prepare before the test. How do you prepare before the test? Give yourself tests before the test. For example, many times people tell me, listen, they started doing tshuva. They're in the path of Hashem now and uh, they're doing better. But they realize that perhaps they, the job that they're working on uh, it's not a uh, kosher job. So what should I do? Now, of course, you could find some Erev rabbi that's going to tell you, yeah, no, it's okay, it's your panasa. You're, you know, you could keep it. You could live a fake life like that. Or you could simply trust in Hashem and say, listen, I have bitachon in you. And what I'm doing is I'm going to simply to test myself that I have bitachon in you. I'm going to quit this job before I have another job. Why? Because I already know this job is forbidden. I already know this job is forbidden. And I already know that you're watching me doing forbidden things and you don't like it. So I'm going to quit. But I don't have another job. I don't have another way to make a living. But I have confidence that whatever you bring me is good. Whether it's a better job, no job, whatever you give me is good. Because why? Because I'm leaving the job because of you. And you, in essence, give yourself these tests. You have to give yourself all types of tests of your emunah and bitachon. And to see where you're at. Obviously, the job, the money issue is a big test for some people. So you give yourself smaller tests. But the point is you have to give yourself tests because the theoretical is not enough. You can read all the books in the world. You can watch all the lectures in the world. It's not going to be enough. It's just like if somebody walks into a surgery and he says, okay, I'm going to do the surgery. Well, doctor, okay, you are, uh, you know, you, you have a medicine, a medical? Yes. Okay. Well, he also has a medical license. Okay, you both have. Why should I pick you over him? Well, the guy's going to tell you, well, listen, I've been doing surgeries for 25 years. Okay, great. So he's an expert. What about you? So I've been reading books for 25 years. Well, great that you've been reading books for 25 years, but how many surgeries have you performed? Uh, none. 
I can't pick you. Well, why not? I read books for 25 years because the books are great. Theory is great, but I need actual experience on the field. He has experience on the field. And that's the thing. You can't just rely on learning it from books and just lectures. You have to go through life's tests and overcome the obstacles in order to get to a point of acquiring this true bitachon. One of the things that you need to do is stop looking at other people's stuff. Stop looking at the other side of the uh, fence. The grass is always greener on the other side. Don't worry about it. Okay. It'll stop in a moment. Stop looking at other people's stuff. That's the first thing. Don't look at other people's profile pictures and family pictures and other stuff pictures. Stop looking at other people's lives. That's the first thing you need to do. Second thing is you have to work on yourself to catch yourself. If you're seeing yourself, desire other things. Stop desiring other things. After you've started putting your desire under control, give yourself some tests from time to time about bitachon. To already show Hashem that you're already acting as if the salvation came before it comes. Before it comes. Why? Because one day, each and every single one of us is going to be given a big test. And the only way that we're going to be able to pass that big test with flying colors is if we passed a bunch of small tests. Just like in school. Every, uh, you know, every week, every couple of weeks, you get a surprise quiz. Surprise quiz. Oh, okay, surprise. It's every two weeks, but it's a surprise. Okay, surprise. Why do you give us all these surprise quizzes? Why do you give us all these surprise quizzes? To prepare us for the test. Because the quiz is, you can afford to fail here and there. But you can't fail the test. Even more so in life. The test that you give yourself, the little quizzes that you give yourself, you can afford to fail them because that's how you know where you stand and what you need to work on. Because you can't afford to fail the big test. If you live your whole life constantly desiring things that you don't have. Oh, I wish I had money. Oh, I wish I had a big house. Oh, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish, I wish. That's not a good life to live. It's not a good life to live. It's, it's literally at least the dust of heresy to wish you had other things. You have to learn how to be happy with what you have. That's what we'll finish off with a story. Someone came to the Chafetz Chaim and told him, Kul Arab, is there a ticket to Allah Rabba? Now the Flame has a little short movie about this. With this story. Is there a ticket to go straight to Allah Abba? And Chafetz Chaim says, yes, there is. Be happy with whatever you have. That's the ticket to Allah Abba. Meaning, regardless of whether you passed the exam or you failed the exam in school, you're happy. Regardless of whether you got married before your friends or after your friends, you're happy. Regardless of whether you get married or you didn't get married, you're happy. Because you have kids or you don't have kids, you're happy. Why? Because whatever you have, a Kadosh Baruch Hu is the one that decreed it. And you have to be happy with it. Not just content, oh, okay, yeah, little old me, I don't have nothing, but I'll be okay. No. Actually happy with it. Happy with whatever circumstance you have, which is very difficult. But if you give yourself these small quizzes to train yourself, guess what? You'll pass that big test of being happy with whatever you have. And if you're happy with whatever you have, you're by default and simultaneously acquiring bitachon. And if you acquire bitachon, then Rabbeinu Bechayah says, you acquire happiness. You acquire happiness in this world. Sure, you'll have happiness in the next world. Bezat Hashem, we'll see each other again on Tuesday. We'll have our era of Mashiach uh, Shiu. And also Wednesday we'll have our questions and answers, a time where you guys will have the ability to ask questions and uh, be more interactive with the uh, with the um, terminal over there. But Bezat Hashem, this too will give us enough chizuk to get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu for real, to actually understand what He wants from us, what we're supposed to do, how we're supposed to get closer to Him. And most importantly, not to live a fake life, not to live a life where we think we've done enough or we have enough. We never have enough Hashem. We never have enough Hashem. We should aspire to have Hashem in His Torah like we aspire other material things. Switch. Flip the script on it. Yetzirah wants us to aspire to have material things, physical things. And Hashem, we think we're have by default. Opposite. We're supposed to do the opposite. Chase Hashem in His Torah. Material things, whatever it is, whatever Kodosh gives us, be happy with it. 
Because if you're happy with whatever Hashem gives you, you're not impressed by much. Big house, small house, big car, small car, good, bad. It's all, it's all Kadosh Baruch Hu. Nothing bad comes from Kadosh Baruch Hu. Nothing bad comes from Kadosh Baruch Hu. A person understands that, he's already a person that's rich. And if he's rich in this world that way, surely he's going to be rich or she's going to be rich in the next world. Baruch Adonai Le'olam. Amen ve'amen. Baruch Hashem, we've completed another year at Bezat Hashem. Rabbi Ephraim and I are very proud to announce some major milestones that we've achieved, Bezat Hashem, and with your help, our dear partners. Over 60 million minutes of our Torah has been watched over the last year. That's a million hours of Torah to help people do tshuva and get closer to Hashem. Over 300,000 CDs have been distributed around the world for free. We've also made over 1,000 lectures between the two of us, as well as also with Rav Chaim being added to the roster. Over 60,000 regular viewers are watching our Torah right now across the board. Over 200,000 answers regarding Alacha, family, Shlom Bayit, different topics on a regular basis being uh, given to people. Over 10,000 people have been helped, whether it's for food or different uh, financial issues. A thousand families of Torah scholars are being helped by Irgun Bezat Hashem. We've published and distributed over 5,000 halachic books, kuntresses, uh, newsletters, Musar books around the world. We are also currently helping over 130 families complete their conversion to Orthodox Judaism. Our TV channel continues to grow, our YouTube channel, our Facebook pages, our WhatsApp pages, everything continues to grow, Baruch Hashem. Thanks to Hashem, and thanks to our dear partners. Be'ezot Hashem, much more next year. B'Shem Hashem Nasev and Atzliach, we're very excited to offer you the new Be'ezot Hashem app 3.0. It's a newer, faster app, full of Torah, lots of Kedusha, by uh, the Shurim that we do, myself, Rav Ephraim, Rav Chaim, uh, where you'll have uh, also newer features where you're able to use the app uh, while you're using other applications on your phone, You'll be able to share the uh, the lectures directly from the app. You'll be able to donate online and support our Cube and our Torah work that we're doing. And the most exciting feature is that you'll be able to actually ask questions directly on the app and get answers from the rabbis directly from the app. This is something unprecedented, and Baruch Hashem will be able to offer it. Thank you again for all of your support. Check it out. Make sure you have the kosher Torah that uh, will re-energize your neshama each and every single day. Call to B'chavat